Well, good morning. <laughs> In the section we'll be looking at today, James speaks to three groups of people, the arrogant, the corrupt, and the suffering. Our study called this section Steadfast Hope, and I think if I had to come up with my own name, it would be Remember What's Coming. If you go on a road trip, as I'm sure we all have, or some kind of long journey, it's important that you know what's coming up. <laughs> oh boy, it's God. <laughs> <laughs> you need to know when there's a gas station or a bathroom or some place to stop and eat, right? Knowing what's cr- coming is crucial to a successful journey. And obviously what shapes your journey more than anything is your destination. Where you're going to end up determines everything about your journey. And if you forget where you're going, you'll get distracted, you'll uh, stop along the way and maybe get lost and you're end up wasting, you'll end up wasting your time or even end up in danger. In this life, our journeys may look a little bit different, but we do all have one common destination, and that's what James points us to today. He wants us to remember what's coming. In our first section, he warns the arrogant, remember that death is coming. In the next section, at the beginning of chapter five, he also warns the corrupt, Remember that justice is coming. And lastly, to the suffering, he says, remember the Lord is coming. So first we'll look at what James has to say to the arrogant in regards to planning. In this section, James is most likely targeting wealthy Christian merchants, people who have obviously have money and means. Come now, he says, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. So what's so bad about this? It sounds like pretty basic wisdom and business sense. Proverbs 21.5 tells us that the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Planning is commended in the Bible. It's good and wise to plan for the future. James's issue with this type of planning lies at its heart. So the type of planning condemned here is boastful planning. In verse 16, he says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. And the word for arrogance here, alazonia, is used only one other place in the New Testament. In 1 John 2, 16, where it is translated as the pride of life. What lies at the heart of this planning then is the sin of arrogant presumption. And James calls it out here for presuming two things. First of all, it presumes that time is at our disposal. You'll notice he says, today or tomorrow, the person who plans like this acts as if endless time will always be available to them. If not today, tomorrow. And if not that tomorrow, the next tomorrow. They believe foolishly that there will always be another tomorrow. And notice too that they talk of spending a year there, which is a pretty long time to plan ahead. It's pretty presumptuous to assume that you will have another year, let alone another day. So they view time as a bottomless resource. Secondly, it presumes ability. He says, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. So this person views themselves as sort of their own ruler and the world is their personal dominion. And they have no thought that anything could stop them from going wherever they want or doing whatever they want or get in the way of their plans for financial gain. Commentator J.A. Moyer says, when James exposes the blemish of presumptuousness, he exposes something which is the unrecognized claim of our hearts. We speak to ourselves as if life were our right, as if our choice were the only deciding factor, as if we had in ourselves all that was needed to make a success of things, as if getting on, making money, and doing well were life's sole objective. And in the entire plan, there is no mention of God at all. God is not even a factor in this plan. So it springs from a really secular worldview and thus it forgets some very important things. 
the person walking in presumption forgets whose they are. James says, you think you have endless time and all the necessary knowledge to achieve what you want. And yet, in verse 14, he says, you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. Sitting here in 2023, I know that we all know what it is to have our plans completely upended, to feel helpless as the world as we knew it completely changed, and to be humbled as we realize that our lives were more fragile than we realized or that we wanted to admit. Yet, COVID and the pandemic didn't really create a new reality. It actually just enhanced reality. It exposed to us what was already true and brought to the forefront of our lives that God and not us is the ruler of the world and that this is all of his dominion and not ours. It shows us that we are not our own, but every breath only comes to us because he wills it and that none of our plans come to pass unless they are also his plans. As the catechism says, our only hope in life and death is that we are not our own, but belong to God. When we live as if we are our own, we are going to get into trouble. James says that the presumptuous person also forgets what they are. The way this person talks about themselves, you can get the sense that they think pretty highly of themselves uh, and view themselves as some kind of important and permanent fixture. They're just, they're gonna be here in a year, of course. But what does James say? He says, you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. As you can see, as I was, hopefully as I was studying this, I thought, wow, there's so much overlap here with our study of Ecclesiastes. Anytime I start thinking a little highly of myself, it's helpful to remember what the Bible compares me to. Things like grass and flowers that bloom in the morning and are gone by night, or mist and breath. <laughs> it's not really very flattering. It's not food for our egos, but it's poison for our egos. And sometimes that's what we need is a little bit of ego poison. What is your life, James asks. The answer being, your life is all too ordinary, all too fragile, and coming to an end all too soon. Death is coming. David Gibson says, the brevity of life, of life is one of God's greatest tools for nurturing humility in his creatures. Do you believe that there are worse things in the world than dying? Worse than dying is living without realizing that I am going to die, not deeply accepting that I will leave this world and the world will barely remember I was even here. <clears throat> when I was a senior in college, my mom's mom passed away, and before she died, she lived here in a nursing home uh, with my, n near my mom, and of course, when I was home, I would visit her, and I remember this one moment standing in the nursing home at the reception desk or something, and I looked down and saw these files of these people, uh, the residents' names, you know, it was like Norma, Jane, Frank, and, and I remember standing there looking at these names and thinking, these people used to be me. There I was, a 21-year-old, healthy, vibrant, and capable. And I thought, someday I'm going to be them, weak, frail, and helpless. And I'm having similar feelings as I'm watching my, now my dad's parents reach the end of their days. And that feeling was so humbling and a little scary, but also so good for propelling me to seek wisdom for life's journey in view of life's end. The destination shapes the journey, and if we forget what's coming and where we're going, we put ourselves in great danger of our lives going off course and make ourselves vulnerable to living in great folly. So how should this heart of humility and wisdom affect our planning? Is planning bad? Well, we already said no, planning is not bad. Do we need to say, you know, if the Lord wills, I'm gonna go to Kroger, if the Lord wills, I'm gonna check the mail? Like, no, that would be absurd and probably really annoying. <laughs> James is not saying that this phrase is like a lucky rabbit's foot. 
Rather, this humble speech, I think, is being contrasted with the arrogant and boastful speech earlier in the passage in order to reveal the root of the problem and the heart behind it. Remember that James is addressing symptoms of double-mindedness in professing believers. The one who boasts of their plans and presumes that they are in control reveals that their plans are disconnected from their faith. And James wants to resync our planners with our theology. When we remember that our death will come without our consent and without consulting our timetables, we are humbled. And when we remember that on the other side of our death, we will meet the God who controls everything and judges everything, we are ushered into the fear of the Lord. Arrogance really is just a distortion of reality. It's puffing ourselves up to be more than we really are. And what James gives us here is a big, fat reality check. So ask yourself, what does my planner, the way that I plan, if you don't have a planner, (laughs) reveal about what I really believe about God and myself? Do I plan my life in view of my final destination? I think if we're honest, we can all very easily fall into this sin of presumption and this illusion that will just go on forever because from our perspective, we've always been here, so that's all we know. So we all often really need this reality check so that we can live wisely and ultimately, if you think about it, live as Jesus did. Going into Good Friday, uh, it's helpful to remember that he fully submitted all of his plans to the Father and prayed, even in the face of imminent suffering, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. James shifts now to address another group of people, the corrupt, another group of wealthy people. To them, he says, remember, justice is coming. Now, there's some debate among commentators about if he's talking to believers here or non-believers. Uh, I read a few viewpoints on each side. It would obviously be a little bit strange for him to be addressing non-believers in a letter written to believers. But many people compare the language here to the language in the Old Testament when the um, prophets were condemning pagan, non-believing nations. He also notably doesn't address them as brothers as he has often throughout the book. But he does begin the section with the same words as the previous. Before he said, come now you who say, and now he says, come now you rich. I think I lean a little bit more toward the line of thought that these are not believers, but I'm no expert. So I think we can either way still receive the warnings of these passage of this passage. So first, we should obviously not be like these people. If you did your study, you see they're doing pretty bad things. Second, we should not be envious of these people or despair when we see them prospering because we know what's coming. Reminds me a little bit of Psalm 73, a wisdom psalm which we studied last semester. Asaph struggled with envy of those who were corrupt but still prospering and wondered if it was in vain that he had lived righteously until, it says, he discerned their end. In Charles Dickens' famous work, A Christmas Carol, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, Ebenezer Scrooge is both antagonist and protagonist. Dickens describes Scrooge as a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. That sounds maybe a lot like the people in this passage. Scrooge hoards his great wealth, all the while underpaying his clerk, Bob Cratchit, and mercilessly hounding his debtors. And as most of us know the story, he's visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. And it's really only though when he sees his future and how he's going to end up dying alone in a grown over grave and all of his servants rejoicing that he's gone, that he decides to change his ways. He discerned his end. While Scrooge is a fictional character, the covetousness and greed of the wealthy people James was addressing here was all too real, and he also wanted to discern their end. First, though, he brings four accusations against this group. So his first accusation is that they are hoarding great wealth. In verse three, he says, 
Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. So the problem is not that these people have great wealth, it's that their wealth is going to disuse. It's just they've collected so much of it that there's so much just sitting around that it's going bad, essentially. And it is this hoarding that James says is evidence against them. It shows where their true hope and security lie. James' second charge is that these people are cheating their workers. In verse four, he says, behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. So these people have been using their wealth and their power over poor, less advantaged people to cheat them and to continue to add to their own wealth. And just as their corroding gold accuses them, so also do these cheated wages of the laborers cry out against them. They say money talks, and it's here not saying anything good. The next accusation is that they are living in self-indulgence. James says they have lived in luxury and pleasure. So we kind of know the word luxury, but the word here, trifeo, suggests very extravagant comfort. And the word for pleasure suggests the breaking down of divine restraint, crossing away from enjoyment of God's gifts into sinful vice. I, the picture painted here is a life with no self-denial or limits. It's like these people would probably have a reality show or something on their crazy life, a life of total excess, which we know has been gained from unjust means. Lastly, James accuses this group of people of condemning and even murdering the righteous man, says he does not resist you. This is a little obscure. It's hard to tell here if James is speaking of literal murder or more like symbolically that these people are using their power and money possibly to tilt the law in their favor and to oppress the poor who have no ability to defend themselves. They're unable to resist this injustice. Either way, we can see that these people are using corrupt and unjust means to gain wealth for themselves, and then they're using that wealth to just live lives of utter extravagance. They are living in complete opposition to God's command to love their neighbor as themselves. Like the person who plans without thought for God or death, this type of person hoards wealth without thought for God or death. James's pronouncement to them is the same. Death is coming for them just as it is for all of us. And when it comes, all their money and fine things will be rotted and corroded. And when you hear those words, you can't help but think of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 6 where he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasure where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But that's exactly what these people have done and that is what they're going to get. The warning to them is the same. You cannot serve both God and money. Just as death is coming for them, so is justice. David Platt says, their treasures on earth would bring about their torment in eternity. Listen to the words James uses. He tells them to weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon them. It's pretty strong language. They have racked up this horrible record and every part of that record will be brought to account. The corrosion of their wealth accuses them. The wages of the laborers cry out against them. And who does it say hears this cry? James says it has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts is a common term used in the Old Testament as a name for God. But it's not like a name you're gonna see on a poster, right? Not like El Shaddai or Jehovah Jireh or something. It's not a name that's gonna evoke good, warm feelings. It's a name that's meant to evoke fear because it describes God as a commander of vast armies. So you do not want to be on the wrong side of the Lord of hosts. When James talks about these cries reaching his ears, you can't help also but think of the book of Exodus when it says that God heard the cries of his people who were being oppressed by Pharaoh. And we know what happened to Pharaoh. He met the Lord of hosts, and so will all who use power and wealth to oppress and abuse. 
The point here is not that wealth is wrong, again, just like the first point was not that planning is wrong, but wealth can lead to sin depending on how it is gained, how it is used, and how it affects our hearts. And James knows the human heart. He warns us against our propensity to envy those who have big bank accounts and houses and nice clothes and fancy cars because we can discern their end. Again, it's like a big reality check. Just like planning, our use of money should reflect that we live in light of reality, remembering that God is in control and that everything we have is his and we will soon die and take none of it with us. And so just as James wants to sink our planners with our theology, he also wants to sink our wallets with our theology. Money itself is not evil, money is neutral. But Jesus did say that the love of money is the root of all evil, and I think we're all, if we can all admit that we've been tempted by it at least a little bit. <laughs> but which are you more tempted by? Sinfully hoarding wealth and letting it just sit in disuse, or spending it on excess and extravagance? Both reveal a love of self. The first gives a false sense of security and hope that's all about us, ultimately. And the second gives temporary pleasure that's also all about us. Again, money is a tool, not an end in itself. It is given to us to love God and love others as he's commanded us. And examining our finances will reveal what we truly love. And again, a reminder of whose we are and what we are will help us to use our money for good purposes and to walk in the fear of the Lord. Next, James addresses suffering believers. Be patient, therefore, he says in verse seven. So we know that therefore tells us that this section is tied to the previous one. Some of the people James was writing to were suffering at the hands of the rich that we just discussed. Maybe they were the laborers who were being cheated by these people. James started out the letter with a call for steadfastness under trial, and now he makes the same exhortation here at the end using Job and the prophets as examples. And remember that when we're talking about steadfastness, we're talking about this idea of wholeness and being complete. And that's why James, ever the practical one, ties a lack of steadfastness in suffering to sins of speech. In verse nine, he says, do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. He, so he knows that when we're suffering, we're obviously very tempted toward grumbling and complaining and even maybe kind of turning against each other. But I'm sure we all know someone who has suffered greatly and yet never seems to complain and always feels seems joyful. And when you're with such people, there's really no explanation for that other than that the truth of God and the hope of God has been so integrated into their lives and into their hearts that they are peaceful and content despite their circumstances. In verse 12, he addresses another kind of speech. He talks about oaths, warning against them that we might not fall, he says, into condemnation. <clears throat> Courtney Doctor said in our study, James wants us to be so seamlessly honest that we don't need to add an oath of any kind. Our yes will mean yes and our no will mean no because that's what whole steadfast people are like. Jesus' coming then should cause us to live in proper fear of the Lord in every part of our lives, even the small things that we say and when we're suffering, but also it should cause us to live with great hope. James calls Jesus Lord five times in this passage, and that's really the point that he's driving home. Hang on, stay the course, remember the Lord is coming. When I was in middle school and high school, I ran cross country, which is funny because I don't think I could run like down the street now, but <laughs> I remember the first time my dad came to one of my races and when I was done, I crossed the finish line and like collapsed, he asked me if I had had fun. And he still laughs, <laughs> to this day that I said something like, Daddy, you, you run until you feel like you're gonna puke. Does that sound fun to you? <laughs> there are people I think out there who enjoy running for running's sake, but I was not necessarily one of them. I ran cross country for the finish line, for the reward and satisfaction of knowing that I had 
finished the race and given it my all. And if you've ever run a long distance race, you know that the mental side of it is really half the battle. If I started to think too much about how far I still had to go or how I could hardly breathe and my legs hurt, and if I forgot that all of this pain was leading me to the finish line, I would probably give up. But when I did reach the last few hundred yards and I could actually see the finish line, that's when I would just kind of summon my last bit of strength and sprint as hard as I could. Knowing my pain would end actually helped me endure it. And that's what James is talking about here. When we are suffering, we also need to be reminded that it will come to an end. So for the first two groups of people we looked at, death meant judgment. But for the Christian who is enduring and looking forward to the coming of the Lord, death means hope and it becomes a promise. Thus, when we are suffering, we need to be reminded of the reality again of our final destination and the one who will meet us there so that we can remain steadfast. In verses seven through eight, he compares this steadfastness to a farmer patiently waiting for fruit. A farmer plants and tends and waits for what he knows will come, a harvest. In the same way, those who endure and remain steadfast in trial know that their patience will produce a harvest that will be reaped at the coming of the Lord. The farmer remembers what's coming, and we should too. Some of us, I know, have endured a lot of suffering and trials. Perhaps you've even been um, the victim of injustice or a kind of abuse at the hands of people who had power or advantage. The coming of the Lord is our hope and the reason we can remain steadfast. And this waiting produces fruit in our lives, making us mature and complete, like James talked about at the very beginning. Thus, James calls those who are suffering, he says, to establish your hearts, or it can also be translated, fix your hearts. The verb here, sterizo, is the same verb used in Luke 9.51 when it says that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem and all that awaited him there. So it implies a steely-eyed focus and determination, the opposite of double-mindedness. Hebrews tells us it was for the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross. So facing his own suffering, he established and fixed his heart and remained steadfast because he knew what was coming and what was waiting for him on the other side. And because he suffered, we know that we can have a steadfast heart that is fixed on the coming of the Lord, who will put an end to our pain and who will bring justice to every wrong that we have suffered. Author David Gibson writes, there is a kind of wholeness available to us in this life that comes from deep, mature, humble, and profound acceptance of the fact that perfect wholeness will be possible only in the next life on the other side of Jesus' coming again as judge. This is the kind of wholeness that comes from learning to believe that vengeance belongs to God, to the God who will only ever do what is right. There is a healing of my wounds that can come in time from knowing that one day the handle of world history will turn and the door will swing open to reveal Jesus, the Lord and judge who has now come to put everything right. And so all of these th three passages call us to great hope, great humility, and great fear of the Lord. They unanimously declare to us that the Lord is coming, bringing with him judgment for the unrighteous and reward for those in Christ who faithfully endure to the end. And as James has over and over, he calls us to align all the technical details of our lives with our professed faith. So we're not just to verbally acknowledge that Jesus is coming, we're to live like he's coming and let that certain reality shape our plans, our finances, and our suffering. Okay. <laughs>